All right. Is this working? Sweet. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. I may post this on Twitter. Check this works. All right. Looks like it. Looks like it does. All right, folks. I'm going to set this up so we can start going. Give me a second here. Um, I'm a pretty, I'm not a, I'm a, not someone that streams all that often. So, all right, let's see who we got in the chat. Nobody right now, which is good. All right, so let me set up this. Let's get this started. Set up this. All right, so I'm trying to figure out how to get to uh, this YouTube video. I accidentally closed it. Well, let me see if I can get back. figured it all out. I, uh, first time streaming in a while, so really interested in, uh, well, I had to figure out how to set up all everything. So, all right, I got all that set up. I got the chat window and everything up and I'm just going to go ahead and get started. All right. So got my Jupyter notebook. Let's talk through what I'm going to do. So Osvaldo, Jean Peng, and I were writing a book, um, and here's actually where it is an overleaf. It takes a little bit to compile, but uh, let me give you, give you that sneak peek I promised. So let's start. We'll let that go for a second. Let me, uh, let me set up this other notebook real quick. Compiling. All right. No big deal. Um, let's do the imports. 
Still compiling. All right. Uh, while that compiles, we're just gonna install stuff. Let me actually stop here and talk about what we're gonna do in case someone's watching this later. So basically, um, I mean, the big news is writing a book on uh, Bayesian methods and if it ever compiles, I'll show you what it is. But let's see, rename. All right, here we go, finally. Osvaldo and the rest of us are writing this book, Bayesian Modeling Computation of Python, and it is pretty meaty. It's got a lot of, it's got a lot. Uh, it's been taking us a while to write, but um, we've got almost like 11 chapters here. I think 12 chapters of uh, pretty good stuff. How to use computational methods to make estimations of parameters and, and all that stuff in the real world. And the challenge I've got is I need to make you all some really good exercises um, because, you know, as a uh, someone who's pretty pretty adamant about open source and learning and all that, you really learn more when you are trying things out and doing them yourself. And that's really what we want to want to strive for. So, I need to write exercises for this linear regression chapter, um, and we've got lots of examples of regressions, and we use the the Penguin data set, the Palmer Penguin data set, but. I'm trying to figure out one that'll be interesting that isn't the Palmer Penguin data set. Um, and so I've got an idea. The idea is, uh, let's see, let me write this down. So you know the problem. The problem is, I need interesting data sets to, um, create exercises with, but, I don't want to use the same data sets that everyone else has. Um, I want a new one. So what I'm gonna try and do here is, I'm gonna try and uh, parse uh, a SpaceX centric data set. And I think, my hypothesis, I think I can get two exercises out of this. I think I can get I think a, a regression example, uh, I should say, a continuous linear, actually uh, it's called a categorical or continuous regression of um, number of Starlink satellites. And I think I can do that. I should be able to sell satellites, right? I worked at the company. And I think I can do, we can do a logistic regression of landing success. Um, and that's what I really want to go for. I want to go for a data set that helps to get sort of these two concepts because from here we can break it down into um, I can break this into, into exercises that are that show prior selection, uh, model architecture, data understanding, uh, and result validation. And that's what I really want to get for for you folks. Uh, so let's see. Anyone else joining? Not. Let me post the link on Twitter just real quick, just in case people, so people can see. Uh, no, copy.
Okay, so that's what my hypothesis is. What we're gonna need to do is, um, I need to get the data from a public, uh, publicly compiled data set. Uh, I'm gonna need to do a little bit of EDA. Although less or so, because to be quite honest, I'm pretty familiar with what SpaceX does, having worked there. Um, and I'm going to need to see if models uh, work out for students. Well, I should say for book readers. I want to be sure that the models are useful for you folks and they're not, they don't have any pathologies or challenges or annoyances that would um, make it difficult to learn the central concept and mark just data, data problems. So there is this awesome GitHub repo that actually when I was not at space, when I was at SpaceX, we were quite impressed with. Um, there's these folks that have nothing to do with SpaceX, but uh, have basically compiled really detailed information about um, each one of the launches and the Starlink satellites. I haven't used this in a year or so, so I, have, I don't know. I haven't uh, seen exactly what's, if anything's changed in it, but in the V4 API, but I don't know, let's just dig in. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to, I'm going to pick install requests. Actually, let me see if we already have requests. Import requests. Yes, we already got it. All right, so what I want to do is I want to get all the, um, I want to get all the landings for SpaceX. So, um, let's say, let's just do this on network. Data pulls for, um, for landings. And what we want to get here is um, all SpaceX missions, and then and whether the first stage was recovered or not. So for the folks that are I don't know, maybe don't know a lot of SpaceX or are interested in SpaceX, um, SpaceX recovers multiple parts of the vehicle now. It covers the first stage, but also the fairings. I don't really care about the fairings, which are the pieces that hold the satellite. We just care about this booster here and see whether we can get the get the booster. So, um, do I want to use one of the clients? Mm, nah, I'd rather not. I'll just use I'll just use the REST API. I don't have to use a package. So let's uh, let's read the docs, shall we? What do we got? So cores crew. Detailed info for the cores. Actually, we don't want the cores. We want launches. Uh, f because, just so you know, cores can get reused over and over again. And I really just want to, I want to model launches. So let us see. Let us get the previous launches. Let's just, uh, let's just take a look-see here in a good old browser. And what do we got? This. Yes. Okay. This looks good. Uh, I know there's around 100, over 100 launches now, which is what we want. What do we want to see? We want to see. Hopefully, they make this easy for me. Details. No. Fairings. No. Payloads. No. Failures. Cores. All right. All right. This is what we want. Perfect. Uh, what we want is we want to get all of the launches. We're going to parse through. We're going to see whether there was a landing success or not um, per per year. So let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Um, yeah. All right. Great. Let's go for it. So um import quests i'll say uh, data equals quest.get spacex launches past 
Hey, somebody is somebody joined the chat. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself. Interesting. Two concurrent viewers. Uh, feel free to say something. Ask questions. I should say. I uh, I should point this out. Oh, I forgot. I forgot this portion. I'll say rules. Feel free to ask questions whenever. I'm happy to to uh, to talk. And then, uh, oh hey Neil, how you doing Neil? Uh, and then be nice. Uh, we we're generally want to be friendly. All right, so since Neil's here, I'll do a, another I'll do another quick explainer. Um, for those who don't know, Neil has got a PhD in stats, so I'm gonna talk at a at a higher level here. But uh, I basically need a, a data set that sort of models the logistic regression. I didn't want to use some one of the also uh, pre-can boring database, or maybe a or boring data set that's already been used before. So I'm gonna um, gonna grab the data for SpaceX's uh, first stage landing over time, and uh, whether they landed the vehicle or not and do a logistic regression using that. So let's see, ABD. I don't know what that is. What's ABD, Neil? You gotta tell me. I gotta learn. Now that you're here, I am uh, I feel like the stakes have gotten higher. <laughs> All right, data, and I need a data.json. Perfect. So, got our data for all the SpaceX landings. I think what I want to get is I want to get a data set. Say the schema. Uh, I want to get the. I'm gonna get the flight number. Um, I also want the the mission name because I know I actually know the mission names pretty well, so and they're kind of fun. So I want the name. Um, <laughs> I'll put dissertation. Oh, maybe. Uh, I want. Um, I want. Okay, this is where it gets tricky because some of the some of the missions have more than one core. So for every core, I want um, landing success or not. This is a one to many. You know, everywhere in the world, when you think things are going to be easy, data always screws you up. So SpaceX had the same problem. We used to be one to one, right? One one core, one rocket. But then they made Falcon Heavy, and now there's three cores to one rocket. So that breaks all of our assumptions. Thanks, Elon. Um, it was real fun to work with when I worked at SpaceX. Uh, okay, so I want to get that and. Uh, I also want to get the vehicle type because I only want to model. No, uh, yeah, I do. I want to get vehicle type because I only want to model uh, the Falcon 9 launches, not the Falcon 1 launches. So Falcon 1 was a uh, was the smaller rocket SpaceX initially launched, five of them, but they uh, quickly moved on to the Falcon 9, which is the workhorse rocket that you see today. Um. I don't see vehicle type in here, which is really troubling. Oh, come on. <sighs> All right, I think uh, for now, let's just skip vehicle type because I really don't see it. Uh, I, can, I can try and find it real quick. Falcon. I'll try and type F9. Does that give me something? I'm trying all the words here. Let's, see if, let's try Falcon. It doesn't look like I got it. I might have to manually filter, which is going to be really annoying. So, all right, forget it. We're just going to do all the rockets. Um, Great. So let's just scroll up here to the top. Let's do this again. Uh, let's just make this two. So it's smaller. All right. So basically, we need. I'm gonna use a. I'm gonna use an. Mm, how do I do this? Okay. 
columns. Let's just write them out. They're going to be flight number. Flight name. Actually, it's the name. Do core number just so we know. Let's do launch date. Actually, we want that. We want um, launch date. And let's just go with that. Launch date. And we want. Um, landing success. All right. So with this, this should be pretty easy for loop. So we say for flight in. I want to call this flights. Launch. I'll call this launches. Um. Yeah, I'll just call this launches. Okay. For launch and launches, uh, we're going to do flight number uh, equals flight uh, flight and flight number. Oh, I should have looked at the keys. All right, we can do that. Um, actually, we'll do a, a single little core, single sign here, name. Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll do, we'll just do calls. Um, flight number, oh, but it's a, it's a JSON. No, I can't. I can't do multi-indexing. All right, we'll do it this way. Flight name, launch date, um, and then we'll say cores equals flight uh, cores, and then for core in cores, uh, we're, we're going to want to iterate here. And get uh, so we'll say data equals an empty list. Um, I want to say enumerate cores because I'm going to want to give them numbers. And I'll do I, which means we also need two more columns here. We're going to need core number, landing success. Um, and I think we're going to be good. All right. So we'll get name here and we'll get launch date there. Why not? Mm -mm -mm. And for now, let's just for debugging, let's just say, um, print core. We'll do, oh, something's off, there we go. Uh, we'll do print and we'll see the first five launches. All right, so what we're shooting for is just to see whether we break on any keys. Um, and there we go. We already uh, have our first challenge. Okay, so the reason is because we want to iterate through the JSON. We don't want to iterate through the returned object. So I need to say launches JSON equals launches that JSON. Just throw that in. Launches that JSON not defined. All right, let's do another query. Flight not defined. Yeah, because I need to change the name to launch. And launch date. All 
All right, this is an interesting one. Um, why can't it get a key? Oh, all right, so the key must be called something else. So we are looking for data, 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 date. Ah, uh, date UTC, it's not called launch date. All right, ah, oh, the font is tiny. Thanks, Neil. I appreciate that feedback. Let's just make this bigger. Hopefully 150 makes it easier to read. Let me look. Yeah. All right. looks a little bit better. Welcome somebody else. I only dropped off. Okay. Um, Neil, I'm surprised you want to watch this. Okay. Flight. All right, cool. This is closer to what we wanted. Here we go. We got the index. We got this, we got the date and we're getting a core. So what we want to get from the core is we want to get core uh, dash the reuse. So in the core objects, I want to get, actually I want to get lending success. That is what I want. That is what I want. Um, and I probably should get, probably should get lending attempt too. I think those would be good things to get. Print Linux hemp not defined. Oh, it's because it's there. All right, all right, and then let's just actually just try hundred of these. And this is looking pretty good, actually. This is uh, this is what I'm going for. All right, cool. So that gets us our data. Um, so for those who just joined, we're trying to parse the SpaceX data set to grab um, a public SpaceX data set to, to grab information on the number of launches and whether stage recovery was um, was useful or not. And the idea is, I think this is gonna help. This will this should be nice for one of the logistic regression um, examples that uh, we're working on. So let us. Uh, let us add this and make this a data frame. So data scientists love tidy data. Just love, love, love tidy data. So let us make this tidy. Um, so what I need to do is I need to say data.append and I'm just going to do this lazily. way. Flight number, name, launch date, Core landing. And what I want at the end is I want a data frame. EF equals PD not data frame of the data and the columns. So we say columns equals columns. And let's see if this actually works. I will be surprised if it does. Oh, uh, and I can take these print statements out. But it, it seems to have worked, so that was surprisingly easy. I'm flabbergasted because it usually <laughs> does not turn out to be that easy. Uh, let's look at the last couple flights. All right. All right. We're looking pretty solid here. Uh, let's update these columns, make these a little easier. And I definitely then broke something. What did I do? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And what do I got here? One, two, three. Oh, core number. That's what I need. Core, good old core number. That is out of sequence. So, um, flight number looks good. Name looks good. Core numbers in here twice. That was not what I wanted. Flight number name. We've launched it over here. Core number. Um, oh, and I don't want landing success twice. I want, um, 
I want I want landing a landing attempt. So landing attempt. I should probably make these consistent. Flight number. Launch date. Core number. Landing attempt. Landing. Alright, so what are we Alright, that's not as easy as I thought. I should not have I should not have spoken so fast. Flight number, name, launch date. Flight number name, launch date. Core number. Why is launch date not showing up? Because I need to refresh my variables. Alright. Classic. Classic me. So I was using an old list. All right, great. So we have got everything. And actually for good measure, um, let's, let's actually just, let's actually just plot this. So this might be interesting to plot because this will tell us whether it's going to be a good problem or not. Um, so we'll do EDA plot. Um, and so I see a bunch of people just joined. I wanted to say, feel free to ask whatever questions you want anytime. I don't mind. Well, let's make a, an exploratory data analysis plot. I think I need to make sure that the, uh, this is a date. So let's do df.dtypes. And it is not. So let's just do some quick data cleaning here. Yeah. Uh, slant date equals pd dot two date time. Create a frame that launch date. That should set it as a date. I think I should be able to do then. Um, let's see if this works. Df dot plot kind equals scatter x equals launch date y equals landing success all right oh man that uh looks pretty good i mean we're getting there uh so admittedly i'm, I'm so i'm checking my knowledge because i've uh, done this before and some things i want to change uh looks like there are some failures down here which is fine but I want to see some more of the launches back here. And I think what's happening is, um, let me explain this. The first, the first launches SpaceX did where, uh, there was no landing attempt. Oh, landing success. There was landing success was none. It's not a Boolean. It's a, I actually don't know what this is. Probably just a string. So I need to replace these with, with a false. Um, so that's what I want to do. All right, so we're gonna add another column. Um, we're gonna say landing success. Um, this is landing success. And we're gonna make a we're gonna make a binary landing success. So we're gonna say df uh, uh, landing success uh, binary equals uh, we're gonna uh, this oh. Landing success got replaced, and what we're gonna to want to replace is I think it's a a non string, so let's because it's JSON, and we're gonna to want to replace this with false. So what we're saying here is, uh, what what's represented in the data, the raw data, is that uh, if there wasn't a landing attempt, the landing success is none, um, which is I guess it's true because there's actually three states where they. They tried to make a landing and it didn't work. They didn't try to, they weren't, the rocket couldn't land at all, so it didn't matter. Or they tried to make, um, they tried to make a landing and it did work. And we want to take this, that tertiary space and turn it into a binary space because uh, I think it's going to make for better problems. So let's try this and let's see what happened. And it did not work. So data frames and data types are annoying. So what we're going to do, we're just going to do this the cheap way. 
I'm going to grab the first index, the first row, and uh, lending success. Try to get that way. All right, perfect. So now we got lending success binary, which means when we when we plot this, we should see more dots over here on the left because now we're including all missions, even the ones that previously had none. And what do we got? Did not work. Why did it not work? Let me try that again. Here. Why did we ah, no, that's the old one. Why did we get a here? Oh, it's, that is right there. So I am confused. Hmm. So the data frame is telling me that it doesn't have this particular column. I don't know why, because there it's there it is right there. Um. <laughs> All right. Well, if I can't do it through pandas, we're gonna do it the old-fashioned MatPlotlib way. So, um. Let's just comp this out. I don't want this noise here. Um, pretty big fan of the object oriented API. So, plt.subplots, um, ax.scatter, uh, df.launch date, and then df. Ah. Uh, Got to do the import. Import map plot lib dot high plot as plt. Grab the plot and then let us. Perfect. All right. Here's what we want it. All right, folks. So what we want to do is what we want. Actually, let me add some more titles for you. This is whether SpaceX launched a rocket and whether the landing, uh, the the first stage only uh, landed or not. And what we have here at the bottom is that it didn't land, that is zero. And what we have at the top is it did land, which is um, the, the one, the success case. So that is the plot that we want. Um, so add a title, X, that's a title. Landing success. All right, so awesome. That was quicker than I thought it would be. That only took, well, 40 minutes. So actually that was longer than I thought it'd be. But uh, all right, we are good here. Now, I think this is the data set that I want to use um, to just, yeah, to make a logistic regression. So let us, let's just do that. Um, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to copy one that I already have because, you know, it's way easier to copy one that I already have. If uh, if anyone watching wants me to talk through the API of PyMC3, you just let me know and I will be more than happy to do so. Um, but if not, I will just copy it over. All right, so what do we got? Here we do, here it is, here it is. So I'm copying the logistic regression from, from the book. Uh, I'll go through it real quick because it might be fun. Um, so for those who don't know, logistic regression is a, is a generalized linear model that lets you model, um, anything, but in this case, probabilities from, uh, it's really good at modeling probabilities because it constrains the, the inputs, or the domain, uh, sorry, constrains the response to, uh, between zero and one, which is just all good for probability stuff. And what we're doing here is we're using PyMC3 and good old Bayesian stats to estimate the, the many parameters, the four parameters, I think, the one we're doing. And uh, we end up getting a plot like this. So we're gonna do the same thing, but for the SpaceX example. Um, so I've already got most of it, most of it set up here. Um, you know, there's the model context for PyMC3. We got some uh, hyperparameters um, and some priors back here on what, they're, what they are. 
Uh, and then we just uh, keep on going. I got to be honest, if we were doing this for real, I should probably do some prior predictive analyses and things like that. But I'm going to, I'm just going to wing it for now. And we'll just, just so they feed into the back end and work. So let us do that. So I have a little bit more data cleaning to do. Um, so let's do it down here. Let's, so let's get our x-axis. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So, um, I'm going to say, uh, uh, I'm going to call this relative date. Well, we'll call it relative date in a second. So, uh, relative date is going to be what we're going to actually, we're going to call it relative day, relative launch day. Um, what this is going to be is this is going to be the launch date of the, uh, of the vehicle relative to the first, the first launch. So the first launch was rat sat or well, Falcon sat, I should say, um, and what I want to do is I want to shift these. Actually, I just want to get the the, uh, the days out of this. So I want to do um, launch date minus launch date uh, min, and I want to get the days out of this. So dot dt dot dot day. Ooh, doesn't have days. Days. Great. Okay. Great. So. What we have is we have the relative date of when um, each rocket was launched. The first one was launched on the zeroth date, and then the 105th launch, which just occurred last week, I think, is on the 5,260th date, which sort of checks out because it's been about 13 years. And if I'm doing the math right in my head, 13, 14, actually, how many years has it been? It's been about it's been about uh, that many years since SpaceX launched their first satellite. Oh, actually, the first one was in 2005, so 15 years. Okay, that checks out. So this is the one, this is a... Uh, like a couple weeks ago. Because if you take 15 years ago and add 5,000 days, it's about last week. So last week or so. So we're gonna call this uh, relative launch day to get an x-axis that's an integer. Uh, get an x-axis. It's an integer. All right, so we're good there. Um, and I think Theano will handle the Boolean date type of the y-axis pretty readily. Um, but we can double just to show you df dot um, landing success binary. Uh, yeah, so this is a boolean right here. So I think it's everything's just gonna work out just nice. So what we need to do this logistic regression is we need to uh, model the mean, and I'll I'll pause for like ten seconds. See if anyone's got a question about logistic regressions because I'm happy to explain them. But if not, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna barrel on through. But actually, you know, let me explain one thing because we're here. Um, what I'm doing, what I would do in this addition, this other logistic regression because it might be interesting, is we were trying to see if we could figure out the species of a penguin by their bill length. Um, this is a Palmer. Palmer Penguins data set from Catherine Gorman, which was pretty handy. Um, we we're trying to get away from the Iris stuff because, you know, Ronald Fisher was, I guess, kind of a jerk uh, in a couple ways. And we want to support other people. So Palmer Penguins it is. Um, we were predicting the, the, the species of a penguin using their bill length. And you can, in this case, you can see it turned out pretty nice. You can, you can pretty readily tell the difference between it. an Adelie, Adelie or a chin strap penguin based on the bill length. So if you ever find yourself one of these days with a random, with a penguin that you're sure is either an Adelie or a Gentoo, you don't know, uh, measure its bill length. And if it's over around 45, it's a, uh, it's a Gentoo. And if it's below 45, it's, a, it's an Adelie. Now you know. We're gonna do the same thing with rockets, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we're gonna see whether SpaceX got more successful landing its vehicles um, based on the day, so. We'll do relative launch day here, dot values. And then um, we have our beta one parameter. Um, this is the sigmoid function, which takes this linear, this linear function and squashes it into um, the zero one bounds of the response. And then uh, this is a, this is actually the, the, uh, the calculation for decision boundary in a, in a uh, univariate logistic regression. So this kind of tells you, actually tells you when things uh, shift from uh, one class to another. 
and I think that's all we need. So let's just uh, let's just try it. Let's just go for it. Let's just see if it works. Um, I don't have a prior. Well, should I? I'm not gonna. I should do a prior predictive analysis, but you know, you know we're just gonna skip it. We'll just skip it to make things fun. Uh, we're not doing penguins anymore. We're doing rocket landings, which is way more interesting. Hopefully, no one is a penguin scientist in here. Uh, and quick fun fact about PyMC3, let's do a pitch here. Um, PyMC3 has a trace object, which was the old thing, but now Arby's has got this inference data object, which you're going to see here in a second, uh, which is quite nice. Dang, and we already got an error. All right, why? Because I didn't run that. All right, so we are going to run our MCMC sampler here. Uh, so Turns out, for those who don't know, Bayesian statistics is pretty cool math-wise, but um, when you well, it's pretty cool when you write it down in symbols, but it's kind of a pain in the ass to solve on paper, um, except for certain models. So recently, folks have come up with these algorithms that make them uh, easier to use. You don't have to worry about your models as much. Um, you don't have to worry about your models as much because this fancy MCMC algorithm will sort of just like magically get the posterior for you. Now, it's not always guaranteed and there's challenges and you're seeing the challenges here in real time because I'm getting uh, getting some problems here, but my first problem is I screwed up on the programming. So I need to fix the name there. Let's sample again and let's figure out what I am doing wrong. Okay, so this is the challenge with MTMC stuff is um, ideally it just works and everything. Uh, you get your samples um, and it, like life's just great, but that's not always what happens as you can see right now. Um, samplers, as the name sort of implies, they try and sample from the posterior uh, and figure out what the posterior is, but the posterior geometry can be challenging. You can misspecify a model, like all sorts of things can go wrong. And uh, what that means is that even though I pulled, in this case, 12,000 samples, uh, PyMC3 is telling me that, that um, a bunch of them were not useful, 75% of them, and that is a pretty good indication that something is messed up about my model, potentially. Um, and so with samplers, you spend a lot of time looking at diagnostics, and that's what we're gonna do here. We are gonna figure out what the deal is. Um, so we're seeing here is various diagnostics for uh, the plots. I don't want theta. Uh, theta is a, it's not gonna be very useful. So I'm actually gonna subset this to uh, to beta one, beta two, and, base, and beta one and beta two. Let me explain what's going on. So the um, what we're getting is we're getting both the trace plot and what's called the kernel density estimate of the posterior of the parameters. So this tells you what your sampler is doing. Uh, this tells you the results of your sampler. Uh, but you also get samples for every single um, every single rocket launch. There's a there's a data estimated for every single rocket launch, which is why you see like a hundred colors here because there's a hundred and five rocket launches. I'm not so interested in um, the particular point probability for each individual launch. I'm more interested in what's I, what's going on with my two sample parameters. So let me let me uh, filter the the variables just to the ones the parameters just to the ones that I want. Uh, so those are these here. And so I'm a little confused because it actually looks pretty okay. Like the these traces look okay. Um, I want to know my uh, my sampler says something's wrong. So let me see what is going on. So I'm going to use ESS and well, that didn't help. I want to get a let's do dot summary. 
Okay. Uh, and I want to get the um, di the di the numerical diagnostics. So uh, to give you a sense, usually my workflow is I look at the I look at the visual diagnostics first and see if there's anything wrong. These visual diagnostics actually look pretty okay, so I don't there's not much I can learn from them. Um, but let me grab these ones. Uh, so what I'm getting here is I'm getting parameter estimates. My beta one parameter. Okay, this probably this might be why. My beta one parameter basically has like no mass to it. Um, there's basically no slope. It's saying nothing is different, which is pretty pretty weird. I would have thought that uh, things would have changed over time. The, this is giving me an estimate of whether my notation is backwards. So Neil's pointing out my notation could be backwards, which could be true, and that's that's one thing that could uh, could screw things up. The only the only reason I don't think my notation is backwards is because I I ran it well. This is why I call it copying models. Is I ran this one and I copied the same notation and it all worked out. Um, so I feel like the same thing should happen here. The slope is per day. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Neil points out the slope is per day, which means it's super super small. Uh, but what we can do is we can just, let's just plot it and see what the hell it looks like. That's kind of what I do. Uh, that's a good point, Neil. And this is why I probably should have gotten a PhD in statistics. So I could have been as smart as Neil here. All right. Uh, let's just grab... Um, let's just do let's do everything about the decision matter first. Do the easy stuff. Um, steer between scatter. And in Neil's point, maybe I should I'm, I might switch this from days to uh, to launch number because that actually might make things core number because that might make things easier. But we'll do that in a second. Let's just let's just try this first. Um, let's just copy some of this stuff over. These labels are gonna be wrong, but let's just try it. Cannot reshape the array. Oh man, so you guys are gonna watch me do my favorite thing, which is array reshaping. Um, the good news is, again, things are copy and pasted. Not many, it's too bad. Okay, this is gonna be fun. So another fun fact of life is you spend a lot of time reshaping arrays to make stuff work out in in data science life. Um, so what I want to get, let's get this right. I want to, um, I want to get the mean of every estimate of theta. Although I'm trying to think, what am I using it for? Let's actually just leave it for now. Let's see what we get. That was not, that's not a great plot. Hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. We want the scatter plot first. So let's just do that. That's the easiest one. Let's just build this up one portion at a time. Decision boundary last. And we'll get the HVD plot last. All right. I have to import NumPy. Should have done that at the beginning. Color QR. All right. What, uh, 
what is happening is I'm just trying to plot the results now as a, as a graph and I'm trying to recreate this particular plot, um, this one down here. So this is the one that we have for the penguin regression that I already had in the problem. And there's actually numerous things here. There's um, there's a scatter, which is the observed data points. We actually already have that one. So I might go and use that one. What I'm really interested in at first is this mean line. And this is the logistic regression over over time. So let me get that going um, first. So the scatter, I'll just, uh, let me just copy from over here just so we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. And let's just make sure that works, should. Okay, great, so we have the scatter plot. The next is we want to get the um, we want to get the mean estimate of theta for each one of the um, each one of the, in each one of the estimates. So I want to double check what I had it over here for. Um, so I got the posterior, got the theta parameter, and then what we plotted was. For every index, we got the theta, we got the bill length, and we uh, but this is a little bit different. This is not a time series problem. This is a this is a scatter plot. So this is actually subtly different. Um <laughs> I don't want to do this one. So on the SpaceX problem, I was using, I was using days, but it actually should just still work out. Um, uh, I was using days. This one uses bill length. So let me think through this really quick. Um, we sort the index. So matplotlib works nicely. I don't think we have to do that for, for ours, but we plot. Okay, we plot the days and plot the days. This should this should still work out. So uh, I need to reshape this array. And reshaping is something that I always fumble over a ton. So we have two chains, 5,000 draws per chain, and we have 106 estimates. That's um, one for each of the, the launches. And what I need to do is I actually need to, yeah, so I need to, Collapse these two and then take the mean, which gives me the probability per launch. So I think actually I should just be able to do it with negative one. Let's try this. Dot reshape. No, that does not do it. Um, I think, uh, well, this didn't work, but let's try it here. Dot reshape. Okay, that worked. Okay, so that's what we want. We got 10,000 samples for every single rocket because two chains of 5,000 draws is 10,000. And we want the mean at each one of these. Uh, whoops. Okay, perfect. So this gives us an array for each rocket launch. Um, the estimated theta probability of that vehicle core landing. Um, so we're going to, we should be able to get that here. So, all right, great. Data worked. Um, I don't think we need the arc sort because we things are already sorted by time. So what I want to plot in this case is, let's do time first. I want to plot the, um, our X axis, which is the relative launch day dot values. And our theta. And fingers crossed, let's see what this looks like. Uh, oh, and uh, okay, fun, fun data science thing. <laughs> it starts in 1970 because that's when Unix epoch time starts and we need to set the offset of, uh, of the min launch day. So what I need to do is I need to add back in um, the minimum date. So let's just do this. The, let's see if I can do this the easy way. Um, plus, uh, 
actually. Dot min date, dot min. Nope, I want launch date. <sighs> always, always having fun with the column names. I gotta say, daytime handling is definitely not one of my favorite things to do. Um, so we need to get days from from epoch start. So let me find it. Python. Well, oh, hold on. Let me think through this. It's it's nice that they converted this into days, but it's not exactly what I want. Maybe I'll just uh, maybe I'll just stick with relative launch day, and we'll just go with it. Uh, uh, uh. Well, I think I'm, su I'm surprised because when I plot this, oh, I know why. Because this is setting the axis. Um, okay, so I, I don't want. Let me do this. So what's happening here is is Matplotlib is getting two types of axes. It's getting um, it's getting a date from here, and it's getting the. Uh, it's getting an integer from, from here, but we just want one. So let's just change the relative launch day. We'll start it at zero and then we'll plot. And actually, this doesn't look too bad. I am not too bad. Hey, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, you join in right right with the fun of it. Um, okay, this is actually pretty awesome. Um, we are getting a pretty good estimate. I think, I mean, odd enough to get estimate. I just, I shouldn't say that off the hand, but, um, but we're getting pretty, something pretty good here. So what we have is, we have uh, every SpaceX launch attempt and whether the core was reused or not, or sorry, the core was core was landed or not. And at the beginning, uh, it was not. And then over time, uh, it turns out it was. I, oh, I'm pretty psyched. So unfortunately, the x-axis is a little, uh, it's not wonky, but it's, it's in date, relative days from first launch, which is like not all that, that interesting. Um, we'll probably want to change this to date at a future point, but I'm going to leave that I'm gonna leave that be for now. What I'm actually gonna do is, is Neil brought up a pretty good suggestion. Um, the parameter, the beta estimate parameter is pretty small. It's actually really small because we're we're uh, modeling over a really big time scale. And so let's just change this to the core number. And that way it, you know, um, it's a much smaller axis between zero and 106 rather than zero and 5,000. So I'm gonna copy the same regression uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it again. I'm also hoping there's I'm also gonna do this because I'm, I'm gonna hope that it might make my sampling work out a little bit better um, I had some sampling issues here and while I could dig into them and do some tuning I really don't want to do I don't want to do that much work <laughs> for for an example problem and I actually don't want um, I don't want the people who are who are um, learning from the book to do that either because you know, I want to. I want this to be easy for them and not a pain. So let's do um, a list regression uh, core number versus success. So we just need to change this to. I think it's I call this core number. Uh, okay. Well, here's a fun one. I clearly made a mistake here. <laughs> they don't, I don't want these core numbers to be zero. So I need to change my data set. All right, so I need to go back here. I'm gonna say, um, okay, so here's what's happening. I have, the core number is relative to the rocket, so I need to change this to uh, vehicle core number. And to give people the, uh, sort of the SpaceX understanding, most of this, most of the SpaceX rockets, I think you guys have seen them, but let me show you, uh, SpaceX. Most of the rockets are single core, like this, actually, this here, see, our, our uh, single core, as they're called. Come on. Why does this picture not want to come up? Let's click view image. Oh, these are tiny. Okay, they finally came up. Most of them are single core, like this Falcon 9 right here. But um, just because, you know, once you set up all your schemas in your databases to be one to one, Elon likes to change <laughs> the architecture of the rocket like five years in uh, and make a Falcon Heavy, which is one to many. So this is Falcon Heavy. Uh, this was a test launch. And this has three cores. So 
Um, there will be there's like core one two three for different launches, and then there's also three cores for one launch. So we need two numbers. So vehicle core number will be this one. We'll call this one vehicle core number. Um, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna be a little sloppy here with my Python, but the capitalization. Uh, but we're also going to have, we're going to call this the, um, I'm going to call this the launch core number. Equals, um, yeah, we'll start with, we'll start with one. And then what we'll do is we'll do launch core number plus equals one. Um, we'll add, we'll add launch core number here. Gonna add launch core number there, uh, and then we need launch core number here, and then we're gonna run this, and we're gonna get an error, of course, and that's because I should name my variables the same thing, clearly, and then I get another one because I need to rerun this, of course. All right, but now we are good, uh, sort of. That did not work. Launch core number. Well, why did that not want to work? Uh, so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the launch core number to, to go up and it definitely did not do that. Um, oh, because it's in the loop. That was also dumb. Okay, so let me move it out of loop. All right, here's what we, here's what we got. Um, and let's start vehicle core number at, at one. So, all right, perfect, here's what we want. We want uh, the number of cores increasing. We want the vehicle core number just in case, but now we're gonna go down here and we're gonna change our logistic regression. We're gonna change it from um, the, we're gonna change the x-axis from being the, uh, the a date to being the launch core number. And we want this to be uh, the lending success. So I'm gonna run this model again Again, you know, you should do prior sensitivity analyses and things like that, but we're not going to do that. Okay, um, that's because I'm missing another key. So this is the one thing about notebooks. You end up with a lot of cells that you rerun. So I need to fix that there. And I need to fix that there probably. All right, I think we're good. Yes, Neil's got it. I should just pair program with you guys all the time. All right, cool. And this one's looking pretty good. There's like this, uh, there's this folk wisdom with with uh, sampling that if your sampling is slow, then your model sucks or something, or your model's misspecified in some manner. The sampling wasn't slow. Uh, we still ended up with, with some issues on the parameter number, but let us take a look. Easy dot plot trace. And then just like before, I just want to grab two of the two of the um, three variables and not the estimate of the of the mean or the estimate of theta, I should say. So I'm gonna grab these two. So I'm in here. Uh, and this doesn't look too, again. This doesn't look too bad. I, I I wonder why my sample is having issues, but I'm not uh, I'm not gonna sweat it for now. Um, for those who are Newer to Bayesian stat, Arby's has got this new uh, new diagnostics from Aki Vetari, who is an awesome professor in at Aalto University in Finland, and uh, he's he's actually strongly suggesting he's got a pretty good paper suggesting why we should use uh, these things called rank plots these days rather than trace plots. So just to give you guys a trace plot explanation, if you haven't seen it. This is a uh, this is this this is the walk the MCMC sampler takes in the parameter space, and what you're looking for is that the trace is able to freely go up and uh, move throughout the parameter space without reaching any sort of restrictions. Um, if it was stuck in an area, you'd see like a high area and then a low area, maybe a high area and a low area. But in this case, it looks like it's going up and down fairly well. There's some areas where it seems to struggle, but uh, you get this quote unquote fuzzy caterpillar. Uh, the hard part though is this can actually hide a lot of discrepancies, particularly when you run models with like five chains. Like maybe one chain is failing, but it's all mixed up in there. Um, rank plots are 
an alternative diagnostic that, that does the same thing. And what they do is they rank the samples. And if the sampler, if a chain gets stuck in a particular region, you'll see that it'll have a lot of, um, it'll have sort of a, a non-uniform distribution of these bars. But this one has a pretty uniform distribution of these bars. So it also looks good. So we'll go with it. Um, I'll probably have to come back and explain what the, what's going on here to the students. But for now, we're just going to live with it. Um, so let's get our summary again, because the summary is real interesting. So let's get a summary. All right, and we get a bigger, well, not a bigger, but like a relatively numerically bigger estimate of beta, which is nice because now these numbers are more interpretable. You get a standard deviation estimate of uh, the parameter error and some, uh, some nice highest density intervals. So let us plot this one and see what this one looks like. Uh, and I need to change the x-axis. All right, this is actually, this is okay. Um, it's interesting. So this one tells a different story. Uh, and actually it's a very interesting story. So I don't know whether I like it or not, but basically what, basically this model is telling us that um, Honest Basics' first launch, it had a 20% chance of, uh, of recovering that vehicle because, um, oh, just because of the regression parameters. So this is, as a domain expert, this is kind of absurd uh, because I know that there was a 0% chance. Like we, SpaceX had nothing figured out about, about recovery or anything. Like nobody thought that that vehicle was going to get recovered at all. Like literally it was a 0% chance it was going to be recovered, like through any, anybody who looked at the rocket and knew anything about rockets. Um, but because we've compressed the space so much, what happens, there's a there's a bias in the in the parameter space here in that SpaceX used to launch one rocket a year at a time. So it took a long time to get the first couple rockets up in the air, but then over time it's accelerated its uh, its launches. Uh, you can you can get that sense if you look at, you can look at this plot. There were very few launches, it's very sparse. And then, and now it's, we're just launching like, or SpaceX is launching like crazy. So the density, the relative density of, of the um, of the launches is like way skewed to the right, but we get rid of that when we go to a core level. So what actually might be interesting is I'm going to use this, I'm still going to use this as an, as an example, and I'm going to have folks explain why this was a good idea or a bad idea. Um, so one thing we can do is we can set a pretty, we can set a pretty strong prior where we tell uh, the model that it has to have a steeper slope. Um, and then it'll maybe do the thing that we want to do. Um, but this also just isn't a very good model the way it's set up. So let me debate later whether we're going to do that or not. But uh, this is a, this is a neat outcome. I mean, this is a good outcome that I'm probably going to put as an exercise. It's like model, model the logistic regression both ways and then explain why this model sucks uh, or why this model is not so useful um, to answer the question of whether SpaceX is going to recover uh, uh, recover a booster or not. And this model is actually much better. Well, from a domain, from a domain perspective, I can tell this model is much better because there is a, a pretty good chance SpaceX is going to recover its boosters. Now, what's interesting is, um, so this is the last bit. This may be the, maybe the last thing I'll try. What's interesting is this is saying there's an 80% chance that SpaceX is going to recover a booster. Um, but what we're, we're also including in here in this data set are boosters that um, SpaceX meant to blow up. So they're, they're every now and then, you know, um, we intend to get rid of a rocket, uh, our booster um, on purpose because it's, uh, we need to for, a, for or SpaceX needs to for a particular mission where there's no energy, there's no fuel left to get back to shore. Or there was like a demo recovery mission where it was blown up on purpose to show what would happen if a booster failed or, um, it's just at the end of its life cycle, and it's okay to do that. Um, it turns out, <laughs> turns, yeah, turns out the, the laws around rocket trash and things like that are kind of weird. Actually, interesting story on this. Um, one time SpaceX meant to, meant to destroy a rocket, so we landed it in the water. So what we did was we didn't want to recover it, so we didn't put the drone ship out there, but um, 
we still tried to practice the landing. So it pra we practiced the landing on water and then the rocket tipped up, landed on the water and then tipped over and it didn't blow up, which is a big problem actually, because A, it's still like a humongous bomb. And if somebody comes next to it, it could blow up. Uh, it's still, you know, a rocket that we don't want people stealing or taking. And um, I don't know if people know this, but countries sometimes try and steal each other's ships from like the bottom of the ocean um, to for trade secrets and understand what's going on. There's actually a really interesting story about uh, an American an American recovery of a, of a Soviet sub way back in the day. And Americans had to fake it, had to fake that the, the, sh the recovery was a mining expedition. Uh, but yeah, we don't want, you know, you don't want anyone kind of taking a, a classified sort of booster there. So the um, there actually is some form where you can ask the Air Force to come in and do an airstrike on a booster. And that's what we did. We asked the Air Force to go in and bomb one of the rockets. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, but, well, let's see. Ah, uh, that's what was the rumor. Okay. Well, I guess I was wrong. Uh, I will point that out. I uh, I had heard that that's what we did, but I guess I was uh, mistaken. That is that is a uh, fake news. So ignore everything I said. That was just a dumb story that had no truth to it. <laughs> well, that was that. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah. All right. Guess it was fake. All right, that had nothing to do with modeling. That was just uh, that was just an interesting rumor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Tyler. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Tyler. Um, okay, cool. So I got what I wanted out of this. Um, I got the logistic regression model. So what else I wanted to do was I wanted to just parse. I need a linear model. I just need a straight linear model. So what I'm going to do is um, I also want to understand how many Starlink uh, Starlink satellites are in space. So for those who don't know, Starlink is a, a constellation of satellites that are going to, that are going to, um, going to provide internet anywhere on the globe because we're going to cover the whole globe in radio signals that get you, uh, get you internet. And, um, and it's actually working. People are using it in Canada and things like that, like beta testers. But what I want to do Bayesian wise is I want to, um, this is going to be a I want to create a linear regression for the number of Starlink satellites that are in space at any uh, point in time. Not at, at, yeah, well, yeah, space at any point in time. Um, and so I need to get from that same data set, um, the, sorry, from that same API, the Starlink satellite number and when it, when it got into space. So sort of the same thing as before. Um, we're gonna use this pub, this API that, that is nothing again not compiled by SpaceX, but uh, but some volunteers that just put awesome information on the internet. So let's go through the data collection in real quick. This one should be faster as well. Starlink satellite numbers, um, and let's grab. grab that so I'm gonna copy and paste a lot of code from before so you don't have to bore you um, this code to help you newcomers out is what gets the um, gets the information off of this API so let's do Starlink uh, let's call it Starlink payload which is actually kind of funny because it's a double entendre here payload for the internet term and payload for, I guess the rocket term. So Starlink payload JSON and then Starlink payload. And let's take a look at what we got. All right, great. Uh, we've got our Starlink stuff here. I'm actually curious what the, sh the length of this is. Um, and launch date. Decay date. Oh, this is interesting. And actually have decay date too. Okay, great. So let's actually get a count. I'd expect this to be, I think it should be in thousands now. I'm, I sort of lost track, but this should be good. Yeah, yeah, okay, thousand. So just so you know, uh, SpaceX needs to get like, at least I believe, I mean, it's been a while since I've checked, but I think around 4,000, 5,000 satellites uh, to get 
pretty good coverage. Um, and then Elon wants to get to like 10,000 satellites because the more satellites you get up there, um, the faster the internet will be and the more people you can put onto it and the more bandwidth and all sorts of crazy stuff. So let us, let's look at this again. We want to get, we want to get the, the number. So I want to get, let's write this down. I want to get, uh, the object name. Actually, yes, let's do name because name's nicer. So we want to get object name. We want to get launch date. And then I guess while we're going through it, let's also just get the decay date. Where was that? Ah, here we go. Okay. Um, and this, this is kind of interesting uh, object structure. It's got this thing, key space track, and then it's got, and then it's got the stuff after it. I don't know why they do that. So let's just write this down. Okay. So I'm going to copy the for loop and I want to type all this stuff out again. So let's copy your for loop for back here. Um, let's paste it down here and we'll say, we'll call the satellite number, we'll call it sat number, uh, for sat in, well, I might not need this. We'll find out in a second. Let's just remove it for now. For sat in, uh, uh, Starlink payload JSON. Uh, we want to get, well, we want to get the object. So, um, just gonna call this object equals Starlink payload JSON dash space track. I don't know whether it's a one to one relationship. So let's just, uh, I guess let's just write an assert, assert, um, I guess cert type object actually is instance. So what I want to do is I'm going to check this. I want to check this as a dictionary. Um, cause if it's a dictionary, then it's not, there's not like multiple satellites under the same space track and I can just grab the stuff out. Um, and if it is a dictionary, then what we're going to do is we're going to, We're going to append to data, um, uh, let's do this. Calls equals object name, launch date, decay date. And we'll say, um, uh, row equals this. Actually, we can just do a, a list of comprehension. So I'll just do, um, data dot append object call for call in columns. Hopefully this just works. Yeah. We're just gonna find out. List indices must be integers, or slices, not a string. Oh, uh, I need for set. Okay. All right. Assertion error. Seven columns passed. Oh, this actually might work out. All right. Well, that that worked. Man, all right, I was not expecting that to go so well. Okay, so what I want to get, oh shit. Oh my God, that's what you hate to do. Oh, get a little happy with the deletes. Um, okay, what I want to do is I want to see how many satellites are in the atmosphere at a point in time, so, or over time, so I'll do, um, I want to do, I want to add an 
I'm going to add a cumulative sum index. So I'm going to say um, df dot. Um, well, actually, I have that from the index. So it actually might be pretty easy. So I'm going to just do uh, df equals df dot. Uh, reset index, I guess. Or no, I know. Uh, I know what I need to do. I need to count by, I'll just do a count by date. DF dot group by um, launch date dot count. Uh, that's what I need. Okay. Um, and I really just want the launch date. So actually, I actually just need the series. So uh, launch date dot value counts uh, and that is yeah pretty much what we want so I forgot to sort or sort values mm. oh because it's sorting the values duh okay uh, we're gonna make this two data frame Series object has no two data frame. Let's do. Can I, can I reset the index? Yeah. Okay, that's what we want. Um, okay, so that's what we want. Sort values index. All right, one step closer. Um, so we'll say uh, sac count, and then sac count. Um, Cumulative equals uh, set count and launch date is actually a bad name, so I should probably rename it. Let me just do that right now. DF dot rename. Launch date. Launch date to um, um, num launched. Uh, no, sac count. Oh, did I? Okay, wait, okay. In place. Go long, change the launch to plus one, decay to minus one. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess we could do that. Um, let me do that later, Neil. I wanna, what I wanna, I'll do, I'll do the easy thing right now is just figure out how many are launched, um, because that'll make it a that'll make it uh, monotonically increasing, which would be nice for linear regression. Um, if I do the if I add the dynamic of uh, launches and decays, then it, as you can tell, then it it, be, it could become non monotonic like, and things like that. Um, so let's just leave that, let's just leave that, let's just leave that out and make this the boring, boring linear regression problem. Cause this is only chapter two in the book and we'll make things easy. But I, that is actually an interesting thing. I'm actually going to model that later. I'm actually kind of curious. Uh, okay. So set count. And I didn't, that did not work. Why did it not rename this thing? Uh, that is annoying. Well, let's just try this. That also did not work. Okay, this is where, you know, I think you gotta do axes equals zero, axes equals one. All right, yeah, there we go. Always in doubt, just guess parameters. Okay, um, we got that, and then I wanna get the cumulative sum, so, sat count dot, Launch date uh, dot cam sum. I gotta I gotta remember how to cumulate something pandas. I think it's rolling, but we're gonna we're gonna find out right here. No, it is it is cam, cam sum. Okay, but it's only implemented on a data frame. So um, series 
Give me some. Pandas. Okay, it's also implemented on a series, so. And that should work. Well, let's just try it down here. Oh, maybe because I have a key error, because I renamed my column. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? All right. Okay, great. Uh, that is exactly what we wanted. Um, and this, again, I'm going to look at this. This actually checks out because we did launch two satellites on the first launch. Um, these were the initial prototypes, and I was there at the time. And then uh, we launched 10 as part of a ride share, and then we launched another one just last week. So great. Great, great, great. All right, let's do, let's make a plot again just to take a look at the data. X equals, I should rename this from index, but you know what? We will, we will roll with it. And then we'll name this cumulative. I probably should name that cumulative count. Uh, hopefully this looks linear. -ish. Oh my God, perfect. This is exactly what we wanted. It's pretty linear. Um, although I'm suspicious because it's too linear. Uh, and my assumption is that this is not a date. <laughs> this is this is a category. So let us uh, let us make sure that it's a date real quick. Um, uh, you rename the column still set to launch. Um, Ah, man. Okay, so Google, Google. Uh, sorry, YouTube streaming is a little slow. I guess I get your comments like thirty seconds after on. Oh, come on, YouTube, got to step up your game. Make your streams more real time. I'm sorry about that, Tyler. You pointed, you pointed on my error. Um, that would have been nice. If I got that in time. Um. Okay, so. I'm actually just gonna, I'm gonna rename index as well because index is not a good name. Index, and this actually should be launch date. Um, so we gotta swap these around. So let's just look at this real quick. Okay, we got that. Um, sat count dot, oh. Wow, how did I do that actually? Sometimes I do things that I don't even know. Sat count dot launch date equals pd dot two date time. Um, that count launch date okay this should be a date time now which means a time this should be a time object so now if we change to that okay this is a little bit more of what I wanted now uh, this does not make for a very good linear regression problem um so I think what I'm gonna do I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to truncate the data in a uh, in 2020 forward 20 let's let's see yeah I'm going to truncate the data for 2020 and then just we're just going to ignore this uh, long period of time um, just so I can make this linearized for to make this a good example problem um, but yeah otherwise it would not be it would not be a good estimator if we took the full date range. Um, it also makes sense when I work there, just because we launched some prototypes way back when, and then a lot of stuff happened. I gotta admit, internal at the company, like a bunch of stuff. So there was a pretty long gap when they were doing some some stuff. Um, I don't know how much I can talk about it, but just like some stuff, and uh, took a while to kind of get back on track. So you can see once they got back on track and we hit our stride, um, things turned out to be pretty okay. So. Let's uh, let's create an indexer. Um, sat count uh, launch date greater than. I think pandas can implicitly do the date time conversion if I make things ISO format. But let's let's try it, and then we'll see. Ah, right, yeah, look, it worked. Okay, great. Um, so Neil, should I do a log transform? The, um, in this chapter, I don't want to do a log transform because this particular chapter, actually, let me just show you. I still have it open. Um, let me show you. So this chapter, oh, this is going to take forever to compile. This book is massive now, so now it's like, takes forever and overleaf to compile. Let me uh, let me just 
Let me see if I have another copy downloaded. Don't anymore. Okay, we're gonna let this compiler come back to it. But um, this chapter two is just linear regressions. We don't have any any transformations um, on um, on the covariates. Just just the transformations for the general linear model. The transformations come into um, in chapter three. Oh, here we go. So chapter two. Let me actually just go to. That'll be most interesting. Yeah, chapter two, uh, you can kind of see it here with the file outline. It just has um, univariate linear regression, multivari multivari I always mess this up. I know we changed the name. Multiple linear regression, because multiple no, multivariate linear regression is something else. Multiple linear regression, generalized linear models. It's chapter three that has the um, covariate transformations. Uh, so I think what I will do is I'm going to make um, this example, uh, where did I lose my oh, relief? So I just mess this up. Uh, I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to make this as an example. I, I'm going to reuse this example for chapter three, where we go into, um, sorry, chapter, well, our, our naming is a little bit off, but chapter four, where we go into transforms. So here's an example of a, we did a covariate transform for, for this, where the, this became a square root and we're like, Hey, you're going to want to. You're gonna to want to linearize things. Ah, oh, this plot's a little messed up. I gotta fix it. But uh, <clears throat> but we do the square root stuff that you're talking about. But for now, let's just jump back to this and um, and make this. Just we're just gonna cut off the portion that's non-linear. So we'll say um, launch filter or date filter. Uh, and we'll just filter the dates out and then we'll be, is this linear? And like, yeah, okay, cool. Looks linear enough to me. So, uh, what we'll do is we'll do the same that we did in the other, uh, with the other model, which is set a relative launch date. Uh, let's just do this. Uh, all right, yeah, equals launch date. All right, I called it something else. Oh, sat count. Sat count, sat count. And I still have a mirror. Oh, one more. Okay, great. So now we have a uh, we have a date, so we're going to change this to relative launch day. Um, yeah, it should be fine because because we can just say the intercept is meaningless, and then we'll. So what I think in my head is because it starts at seven hundred. Where if you extrapolate this model, particularly closer to, to zero, it's going to say there's negative satellites in space. Um, which obviously would be kind of dumb, but I'll, this will be good too, because then I can throw this in the example and say, um, what happens to the launch day is zero. What is, what is going on? And then, you know, people have to, you know, understand that it's a model and think about that. It's a model and understand that it's a model. And that'll be just a really good portion of the exercise. So actually I like that. Okay, cool. So we're going to do the whole uh, Bayesian thing again. This time I'm going to do it from scratch because it's a linear regression. It's not too bad. So we'll do, um, with pm dot model as set model, and then um, we need. Um, I'm just gonna. I like in this chapter. I've been doing things. Um, in this chapter, we don't have dot. We're not. We actually don't show dot notation. Dot product notation. So we're just gonna leave that off. Um, we need beta zero equals pm dot normal. And I'm gonna set, I set a fairly wide prior. Let's say um, beta zero. Actually, let's just set up. Let's just set a really crappy prior. Let's just say we have no idea. So what we're saying is that we've have no idea what this 
what our intercept is. Well, we have we have some idea of what our intercept is. It's centered. It's probably zero centered, but has a massive standard deviation. And then let's set a uh, one for our slope. I'm just gonna say 30. I so I know it's 60 per launch. So this fun fact: it's um, most of the time it's 60 per launch because that's as many satellites fit into the fairing, um, and you want to use up as much space as possible. But let's just set a fairly wide prior. Um, so we'll say that we think it's a mean of 50. We think before seeing any information that the intercept is centered at 50, um, but could vary normally with, an, well, could vary its Gaussian distribution with a standard deviation of all that jazz. And then um, we'll use the mu, we'll set mu. And so um, you don't have to do this in pi MC3. Um, you, you can just, you can just, um, multiply the parameters directly and do the regression directly. But this has a benefit, which I will talk about in just one second. Um, Stack count dash relative launch day plus uh, beta zero. So <clears throat> what happens here is we can actually leave this out um, and and model this like this. I'll put a comment here. You don't need the PM deterministic. Um, so you don't need the you don't need the PM deterministic. But if you do this, what happens is you create a node in the backend in the Acera backend. So previously the backend was called Theano, um, but we've forked it and now it's called Acera, and we're making a bunch of changes to it. But essentially, the backend will keep track of. Uh, keep track of mu and what the values of mu are rather than just discarding them. So that'll be nice. Um, call this y. And then we'll say pm.normal. So we'll, we'll assume that this is also um, I distributed with some some noise. Oh, I should make this a, I should make this a scatter plot because I want to see the no noise. Okay, cool. So uh, we'll say well, I'll call this num satellites. Num sats in space. And we'll go with that. And then um, this is, oh yeah, we need one more parameter. So this is uh, the, uh, our center, our mean estimate of the of any values here. I forgot our sigma. So this is our error term. Um, equals pm dot half normal. I use a half normal. So I'll say sigma, and I'll give this a pretty wide standard deviation as well. Say thirty. So the reason I'm doing this, um, normal distributions have pretty thin tails, and if you set a small standard deviation, you're setting low probability values for things that are far in the tails. But if I set a value of thirty. I actually know what's great. I'll just set a value of 100. If I set a value of 100, that puts a lot of mass all the way up into like the 200, 300 range of possible um, errors. So we'll just do that. And because this is a pretty simple, I mean, this is a relatively simple problem for um, a sampler, like it should be fine. Um, so let me just copy and paste the boilerplate. All right, so I'm gonna call this sat number. Uh, sat number. Oh yeah, and I promised I told you I'd show you what the difference is, but I didn't. So let me let me do that next time. Let me do that after the samplers work. Uh, can't contain an assignment. Did you mean equal? Oh. Okay. Uh, and it got it was just the keyword sigma. Oh, SD. All right. Wrong directions. Oh, and I forgot my observed. Okay. Uh, I messed up a keyword and I forgot to put in my observed uh, values, which are sat count cumulative.
All right. And we're in business. So while this is going, it should be pretty quick. Um, Pime C3 uses a sampler called the no U-turn sampler. It's this nuts thing. And that is the uh, fanciest gradient based sampler on the block as it may be um, right now. So this is like sort of the state of the art. People are trying to come up with new ones. Actually, people are coming up with new ones. Pretty, pretty smart folks. So this might get superseded pretty soon here, but right now it is good. Um, it's good. It's a very, very efficient sampler and efficient in both the computational and in the statistics terminology. Uh, so let's talk about what the difference is here. Um, PyMC3 used to have this object called a multi-trace that was specific to PyMC3. Uh, the problem is that every library would make their own version of a posterior, um, like a posterior object. So it was really hard to trade results and share results and things like that. So on the Arby's project, we have created this structured uh, thing called the inference data object. And what it has is it has all the different uh, bits and pieces that you want from, or you could be using during your Bayesian inference in a one nice package that's consistent. So people can do their inference in like Stan or Turing or whatever they want. And then if they, they decide to put the results in an inference data format, then you can do all of your um, diagnostics and model comparison with the same format, which is pretty gosh darn handy. So this is good. Um, there are no issues in the sampler, and I would be surprised if there were because linear regression is pretty much as easy as it gets. Let's just plot a trace just to check it all out. And that uh, looks, looks pretty good. Uh, we, we'd expect our beta to be negative because looking at the, looking at the regression, our intercept would be negative uh, at zero. And then this looks pretty, pretty solid, pretty handy, 1.2. I mean, at a glance, it looks like a pretty good fit. Uh, Sigma seems suspect. I gotta admit, I'm a little, oh, you know what it is? I, I know what happened. I know what happened. Oh my God, you guys, you know what happened? I didn't put the date filter in. Uh, oh, what a mistake. So we'll say, uh, we'll say filtered sats. Okay, so let's actually go through this because this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, this is pretty suspect because it's telling me that my, um, that we're not launching satellites very fast, which seems pretty wrong. And also that there's a lot of noise in the, uh, in the normal estimate around the mean, like way more than I would have thought looking at this plot. But that's because I included all the data. But you know what, for the sake of the live stream, let's plot everything and then uh, I'll show you what it looks like. So I'm again, I'm just gonna copy and paste plotting code because you know, I don't really wanna plot this all by hand again. Um, so here's an example of another univariate regression and I'm just gonna copy and paste all this junk. Uh, yeah, okay, that's exactly what we want. So let's do some good old copy and paste here. Um, let's say set count. Uh, we want set count, min set count. That count mean oh I need these alpha and beta well oh, that was that's a mistake I gotta fix that um, all right let's just plot that for now let's just see if that works before we do that other stuff okay uh, that looks good this should be should be set count uh, and this should be um, stats. Actually, this should be relative date. Uh, oh, it's like that now. I screwed something up. Well, we don't actually need to do this, so let's just do 
Um, what did I? What did I do? Oh, I I renamed my data frame. That was dumb. Okay. Well, don't don't overwrite your objects. That's a that's a lesson in life. All right. Let's pick that. So let's name this one set count x. Uh, set count x. Set count x. Okay. All right. We got that back. Um. Okay. Let's do these one at a time. Um. We want to plot the observed. No, we want to plot the um, the dependent variable. Sorry, the independent variable. The independent variable, which is the days. And we want to plot um, the number. Second cumulative. Ah. Uh. Ah, well, I destroyed my array and I didn't fix it all. Okay, got that back, got that back. Okay, and you're starting to see the issue here. So we got that, and then let's actually plot the uh, posterior density because this is some of, you, anyone can do this, right? This is this linear regression, you, a single point line estimate you can get from basically Excel or Tableau, like not all that, not all that impressive. But what we can do is we can plot the um, we can plot the highest posterior density, which is a thing you can you really only do with Bayesian stats. Well, you can do it with frequency stats too, but Bayesian stats make it nicer. Um, logistics stats. Ah, oh, okay. I know what I, did. I messed up here. I call this mu. Uh, variable is named differently, so. You. Okay, here we go. So this is what we have. Um, this is why things are messed up. And it, we, having this uh, this density plot is, a, is kind of a nicety as well. Uh, sorry, having this highest posterior density. So what we have here is we have the mean posterior line if we model this whole thing together, even these far out points. But clearly, it's not a very good line. As uh, Neil had pointed out earlier, this really looks like a... Like it, like it needs a log transform. Um, but the nice thing, at least property wise, is I mean, you still get an estimate, but uh, you get these wide uncertainty intervals. Um, or kind of back here and back here, and you, you get the narrowest uncertainty interval at the uh, at the middle. So not a great fit. I mean, just looking at it, obviously it's pretty terrible, but it's nice to have uncertainty fits, I guess. Um, rather than just uh, the mean line. But we are definitely not gonna stick with this. What we wanna do is get back to our filtered data. So let us go back up here. Uh, and this actually might be another, be another good exercise. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this as a, as a good exercise for, for, the, uh, for these people that are reading the book. But we're gonna, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do, we're gonna do a filtered satellite count. And I should've read, I'm, mm, I'm gonna do this. For the sake of this webcast, I'm gonna just destroy my old data frame just to make it work. It's a little late. So I'm just gonna overwrite it here. And I'm gonna rerun this regression. And uh, don't need to look at inference data, but let's look at our trace again. And we have a bunch of divergences, so this is interesting. Um, divergence, okay, so for those who don't know, divergences are telling you that, um, divergences are telling you that, that, you're, <clears throat> that your gradient-based sampler is trying to sample a point, but it actually can't get a good estimate of the, uh, the log probability. Of, the, of a particular area. That may be because it's, it's, well, it's not well defined or there's tricky geometry or something like that. Um, and so these usually mean you have sampling, sampling problems. The reason this is interesting is that for something this simple, I definitely would not be expecting divergences. Um, it seems very off. So let me just, let's see what the parameters end up being. 
Um, let's just go with it for a little bit. Okay, so the estimate is not too bad. So, it's kind of interesting that we end up with divergences. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, it this doesn't look the fit doesn't look too bad uh, when I plot it. And let's uh, let me make this a little bit better. better. I'm just gonna artificially change this to 800, just because I can see it. Or maybe 600. Um. Okay, so it doesn't look terrible, but we're getting some issues. So let me see if I can. Let me see if I can diagnose this uh, on the fly. Let's see what's going on. Um, so what's interesting is they don't, the divergences don't seem concentrated. So sometimes you, you see them concentrated in one region or another. I don't see a large concentration of divergences in a, any one of the, uh, plots. What I think might be happening is that the beta zero is so far negative that our, uh, that we might need to set a better prior. So let me try that. I'm like, I'm not hundred percent sure, but. Let me just try it. See if that helps. Any? Uh, I'm gonna guess no, because I can tell that it's already, oh, we're already getting some stuff here. Okay, so it, it's, this is pretty weird. Um, Pretty weird to be getting divergences at this point. So something might be wrong with uh, my data. That's one thing to look at. That's the first, the first thing I looked at. So let's look at stack count. And things look pretty all right. None of these are null. There's no random aberrations. So we're good there. Um, the multiplication looks good. Oh, so another one is my, the, the standard deviation is massive. So, um, let me try. Okay. So here's, here's where we should do this the real way, which is setting a prior predictive distribution. So let me show you what a prior predictive distribution looks like. So what a prior predictive distribution does is it shows you what the possible fits are before there's any data. So, um, prior predictive, I'm going to call this prior predictive equals pm dot sample prior predictive let's see if I got that right oh this actually might be a you find it Is it? Um, oops. Sample put ah oh, sample prior predictive. Okay, um, yeah, that's what I have. Okay, sample prior prior. Okay, sample prior predictive. That's what I got there. Did not look like it's sampled. Oh, I, I guess it, I guess it did. So, uh, I actually need to follow bug ticket because it should tell you, so I, it's supposed to tell you that it's sampling the prior predictive. Uh, the fact that it didn't is a little bit concerning. So I'm going to have to fix that. Um, but here, what we got is we got these things called prior predictive samples. And what they do is they tell us that um, if we're just using our priors, which is the distributions prior to being conditioned on any data, what would possibly regression fits be in this case? And I want to plot those um, because they're good to plot. So 
I'm gonna copy. I'm gonna again copy the um, some code from from another notebook. Oh, can you check the prior scale? So Neil is saying, um, check the scale in beta one, uh, which is the unit again is per days, but the scale is per launch. Um, yeah, actually Neil brings up a good point. Um, the scale might be off, which is one issue. So um, let's do, yeah. So if the scale's off, the prior predictive check will actually help us see that. So let's actually just plot it. Um, so I've been lazy in these last couple examples. You should, you should, um, think through your priors more than what I have been doing, which is just kind of putting them down. Uh, you really should be running prior predictive checks or using informed priors. Uh, and I've just been like, I've just been winging it, which is not the best. And I end up with all these issues. So let this be a lesson. Think about your priors. Some. And so we're gonna do our first prior predictive check here, which is um, we're gonna plot. We're gonna plot our draws against each other. A frame state has no attribute posterior. Uh, Oh no, I might have to go through all my work that I want to. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, a little bit better. Um, and then we'll say x equals np dot lin space 600 to 1000 um, see increments 1000. Okay, so here's what a prior predictive check says. Um, and you can see it's pretty much a disaster. Uh, let's just double check. Oh, well, something actually something's Yeah, actually this is exactly what it says. So here's here's the issue um, if, I, if I haven't screwed with the plot what what's happening is uh, At least I think what's happening. I should double check my math But if you set really stupid priors you end up saying that all these lines are possible lines prior to actually fitting the data like all of these uh, I, And I actually yeah, I guess probably that's true so all these lines are possible lines. Um, and this is ridiculous. Like we would never have something that starts up this high or starts down this low. Like this is, this is crazy. Um, it's, it's a, this could be one reason I'm getting issues. This actually goes right into the comment that Neil had, which is, is are my scales off? And yeah, my scales could also be off. So what we want to do is I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to center the, um, I'm going to center the regression, which means the intercept of the, the mean will go through zero. Um, that'll just make it a little bit easier for the, the intercept parameter, which I actually th ideally should be zero, but, um, and then that should just let us focus just on the slope. So we're going to say, let's do a little bit more data cleaning here. Okay. So we're going to say stack count dash, um, Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna change this to be, to zero. So instead of center, so instead of being centering, I'm just gonna shift. So I'm gonna say uh, relative launch day minus relative launch day dot min. Well, oh man, that's what happens when you don't do that right. Okay, let's uh. Let's reset this. Sat count. 
Oh, fifth launch day. Plot this. Looks good. Good there. Okay, so what we did now is we set a relative launch day to um, to zero. So on day zero, we don't actually need um, on day zero we don't actually have any satellites in the air. This actually means we can get rid of the intercept parameter altogether. So this is an interesting thing because we're starting a regression at zero zero, and we know that on the zeroth day, um, well actually we should, we should, we need a little bit of a regression. I'm sorry. So we can set this. Um, we can actually set this to a fixed number. And I'll probably come back and change this later. But we can set this to a fixed number because we know on the zeroth day there were two satellites. We don't have to estimate that intercept whatsoever. So we can just set this to a fixed parameter of two. And that just lets us estimate the slope and um, the sigma. And that should be that should be fine. There's no rule that you have to you have to um, model everything. So let us just do that. And let's see if we get any divergences. And this actually is much better. This is great. Um, so now we can plot our trace again. And things are looking a little bit better. Um, I'm a little curious about the beta. It seems off. But... Oh no, to Neil's point again, the scale. I keep forgetting about that. I'm we're modeling this in days. We're not modeling this in uh in um how would you call it? In in launches. So to Neil's point, we are we are we have a different scale of our input than we would normally. So uh and I need to Okay, so I need to fix this. So I still have these two in here, which I don't want, but I don't have them up here. So I think I just messed up on my, my plotting. Um, so let me just double check. Relative launch day, okay, that looks good. We're gonna start this at zero. We'll go to max. Um, where are things going wrong? So this is the not fun part of this is actually the part that I always dislike is uh, cause I gotta go through all this. So this is an interesting r result, but I'm trying to figure out why I'm still getting the uh, getting those other values in there. Hmm. Oh, they're in there. That's because I didn't filter them out. Of course. I'm sorry. Um, I took the filter out. That was naive of me. So sat count equals, let's just do it up here just to double check. Okay, this should filter out the earlier data points. And we can just, uh, it looks like it has. Unfortunately, I have to, I have to recalculate the um, early date again. Okay, there we go. So I'll set the relative launch date to the to the first one here. And I know I'm sort of butchering this regression now, but when I set the relative launch date to the first satellite, 
uh, launched after our after our filtered stuff. So now if I plot this, same thing. Let's plot it down here. It starts at zero and then it goes up. So we can say from the first day, every day, how many satellites are being launched. So to go to Neil's point again, the, it's not the number of launches that's the x-axis, it's the scale is the, the number of days. We'll run this regression once more. It's looking good. Plot a trace. Things are looking solid. Our estimates of the mean are nice. And you can tell they're getting a little bit more dispersed as we move out, which makes sense. I don't need that. We'll plot this. All right, that's looking pretty pretty good um why are it, what is setting my very long x-axis okay, well i don't know but let me just do the easy thing ax dot set x slim zero um 400 all right all right all right not bad so i'd fix i'd fix the uh, i'd fix the slope the uh, the um, the intercept. So let's actually uh, let's actually unconstrain that. Let's actually go back um, and get rid of that. So let's actually put that back in. Let the intercept intercept float. So mm, I could set it to sixty. I could set it to sixty because we know we know that. Um, but let's just let's just let the regression you know do its thing. Um, since we have, we know it's 60 per launch, we can set this to 60 and then give this a pretty small, you know, pretty, I don't know, say pretty wide standard deviation, 30. And we'll leave all these parameters the same. Oh, I need to fix this. I'll have to run that again. Okay, one divergence, that's not terrible. Two divergences. Usually if you get one or two, it's not it's not the worst. So I'm just gonna count them as false positives. Um, they're over here. Actually, this, this is fine. They're over here in a low density region of the posterior. So it makes, it makes some sense why those might occur. I'm not sweating it. So let's just take a look at our regression. And it's looking pretty good. Um, I have to figure out which one of these is screwing up the scale, but let's just uh, let's just set this things manually for now. YLM to one thousand. Well, I definitely oops one hundred. It's too low. All right, okay. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain about that. That looks that looks uh pretty good. Um, let's just look at our parameter estimates and make sure they check out with reality just because I'm curious. Uh, and we'll just stick here. And yeah, this is good. So uh, so this is a fun fact. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, uh, maybe I, I filtered out one extra data point, maybe one more than I need to. I need to figure that out. But uh, I think the, the, the interesting part I have Elon wants to get, um, you know, he wants to get 10,000 satellites up there, which means he'll take at the current rate of two a day on average. Um, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take, uh, I mean, 5,000 days. So it's like 13 years before Starlink is all good to go. Uh, so SpaceX is definitely going to have to speed up their daily average of launches. Now they're planning on doing that and it's part of the plan, but, uh, yeah, they're really gonna have to pick up the pace uh, to get to Starlink uh, numbers that they want to get to. So that's uh, cool. With that, that's all I got. I mean, these are the uh, these are the two examples I needed. I needed one logistic regression example, and we got it. I actually think this one's pretty good with the with the rockets, um, both daily and number. And then we got one with Starlink. So this is gonna be pretty good for the book um, that we got here. I mean, if I might selfless, selfishly 
promote this thing. Um, there's just a lot of, I'm really, I'm, well, I gotta see, I'm excited to get it out just so I don't have to write it every day. Cause every day I wake up and I'm like, I gotta write this stupid book, but it's like a marathon, right? You know, you gotta, you gotta do it. Uh, let me show you the table of contents though. Cause it's pretty cool. So, um, I don't know. We got like things that we covered. Well, we got the basics. So what is Bayesian methods and all that crap. Um, but they've got linear models, which is, the, we were doing this chapter, but then there's other chapters on splines and time series and added to regression trees and ABC and all that. So at some point I got to write exercises for all of this stuff and I'll probably be back on streaming talking about it and hopefully joined by you folks again. Uh, Tyler asked, what's the ETA for the book? Um, I'm going to say uh, we forecasted Feb. We're definitely way off. <laughs> we, uh, I think, uh, I'm hoping in the next couple of months. So I'm going to type this chat. Hoping for a draft uh, for a publisher ready copy. But um, yeah, that's what we're, we really want to get out there. But we're, it, we're over the we're over the the, uh, the we're over the hump. I think we're, it's it's nearly almost there. Um, most of the chapters are written out. Like let me skip. My favorite chapter is the Bart chapter. Um, but like yeah, a lot of the chapters have stuff written and there's a ton of content. We're just writing the exercises and cleaning up the um, cleaning up the figures and the code. And then it's got to get uh, copy edited, which means that the CSC press is going to read over it and fix any things. But yeah, hope to get it out soon here. Thanks for asking, Tyler. Um, in the meanwhile, if you got Bayesian questions, just feel free to ask. I mean, you got me and a whole bunch of others I can help try and answer for you, but hope to get this, hope to get this singular thing out for you. Um, but otherwise, thanks guys. I, uh, this was fun. I think I'm going to, you can do it again. Tyler and Niels, thank you so much for your, your engagement and your questions and sticking through. I it really gives me hope that, uh, more people will join next time and, and people will find value in this. All right. Enjoy your evenings, folks. I will, uh, I'll see you around.